morning. Welcome, everybody. I trust no one got too wet coming here or had to swim. That was an impressive 40 millimeters that we've had over the last 24 hours. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Judy, and I'm going to be leading the service. And the focus of today's service is encountering Jesus at the place of being downcast. Another word for being downcast is being despondent. And haven't we all felt like that at times? Perhaps when something we've really looked forward to hasn't worked out, or something that we've planned has gone wrong. So I think we all know the feeling of despondency. Um, but interestingly, I was reading the Age magazine yesterday, and what I found quite surprising and saddening was the fact that they were saying there's a problem with many older and very competent people landing jobs nowadays. And I was thinking how despondent people like that must be feeling. But this is something I guess humans have felt over centuries, millennia. We think of some of the characters in the Bible, and particularly the prophet Elijah, as he was fleeing from King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. He went through a period of despondency. So with that, I'd like our worship team to come up front and to lead us in some rousing songs. Thank you. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship your holy name The sun comes up It's a new day dawn it's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Draws near 
and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever more bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship him Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name, I'll worship your holy name, God I'll worship your holy Well, good morning and uh, welcome uh, to uh, Beaumont Smorty Alec Baptist Church, whether you're here on site or whether you're watching us online uh, on this wintry uh, Sunday morning in the middle of school holidays. So uh, <laughs> well done on being here. We have uh, quite a number of people away with school holidays, uh, but we're glad that you're here and uh, our musicians are having a break this morning. And uh, so uh, it's important to, uh, to, and our children's ministry leaders having a break, and uh, youth ministry leaders over, um, over the school holidays. Uh, but we want to welcome you, and I want to invite you to take a moment, if you're on site, just to um, connect with somebody, uh, uh, somebody around you, somebody you don't know. Just, uh, just greet them, just uh, have a conversation for, for a minute or two before we come back together again. We're here to connect with God, but we're here to connect with others as well. And uh, that, that helps to spur us on in our finding and following of Jesus. We do that as a part of a community. So it uh, would be great if you could stay for morning tea. Uh, the, the barista coffee is, is available. Uh, you can get your, um, your tickets for that at the counter in the foyer. Or regular morning tea and coffee served in the back hall. Kids packs are available with children's ministry. You're not being on over school holidays. Uh, kids packs are available in the foyer as well. Uh, after morning tea this morning at half past 11 will be our annual church meeting and uh, that's, um, uh, that, that's right here and this is an opportunity ag again to just be more aware of what's going on in the life of the church and God's work over the last year and uh, things are looking ahead as well. There'll be ministry reports uh, which uh, will um, be uh, letting you know about some new ministry leaders in, in different areas in, in the life of the church, as well as looking back on, on what's been in ministry areas. There'll be financial uh, reports, uh, there'll be updates with uh, staffing matters and arrangements, and, uh, and um, property updates as well. So all of those are past 11 at our annual church meeting. Small groups, if you're not a part of a small group already, we really encourage you to consider being a part of one and there's an opportunity over the days and weeks ahead to, to join either an existing small group or a new small group. And uh, uh, over the next couple of weeks, um, uh, th this, this Thursday actually, uh, a daytime small group at uh, Junie's place. Uh, so come for a cuppa, come for a biscuit, <laughs> and come for a chat about, uh, about that daytime small group, Thursday, 2 o'clock, 
uh, this, this coming Thursday, 2 o'clock, if, if you're interested in exploring that at, at Junie's place. Uh, Junie, yeah, would, would you just stand up uh, uh, for, for a moment so that if you don't know who Junie is, uh, then, then just have a chat to Junie afterwards and uh, she'd be delighted to welcome you to, uh, to uh, as she seeks to host that group uh, Thursday afternoon at 2 o'clock. And then there'll be an evening group that'll be uh, starting soon, uh, 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 later in the week. It'll be, uh, we haven't quite worked out exactly yet. We've had to change that. <laughs> but uh, Shirley and, and Ivan will be hosting a group. It, it'll, be, um, uh, it'll be Friday or Thursday evening, we think. Not, not Monday evening as it was planned to be. There's had to be a change there. Uh, but it'll be later in the week in an evening. And uh, again, Shirley and, and Ivan, would you, would you stand up? Uh, uh, speak to Shirley or Ivan uh, if you'd like to link in with, with that group. And then uh, Phil, uh, Phil is hosting a group on a Wednesday evening, a special interest group uh, with a focus at, at just uh, um, around uh, public issues and Christians, different Christian perspectives on that. Phil, uh, again, if you'd stand, uh, have a chat to Phil this Wednesday night. Uh, he'll be uh, he'll be hosting hosting that. So um, a chat to Phil about that. So the, these are some of some of the new groups starting, as well as our existing groups. And small groups are a very important way of uh, community in in the life of the church. Getting to know people in a, in a more significant way and uh, journeying together in life and faith. Uh, we typically have stories of life and faith as part of our. Um, communication time. Today's one's a little bit different. It's actually acknowledging the life of someone um, and uh, the, the life of Myrtle. Um, Myrtle was a, um, a, per, a, a godly, gracious woman over many years, uh, cheerful, thoughtful. Uh, Myrtle was a part of our Morty Alex site congregation for, for many years after moving out from the, the UK. And uh, Myr Myrtle even attended here. Her daughter would bring her um, uh, uh, as she was able to, uh, but Myrtle uh, went into palliative care quite quickly uh, in the latter part of the week and then passed away yesterday afternoon. So today we acknowledge the, the, the life and the faith of Myrtle and uh, give thanks to God uh, for her life and for her faith. Baptism and church membership, uh, still uh, opportunities uh, for, for you to speak to myself or Pastor Kat if, uh, if, if that's something uh, reflecting God's work in your life or your commitment to, uh, to, to this local church family. And then we want to let you know uh, in a couple of weeks' time, Sunday the 30th of April, of um, uh, Myanmar Sunday. We're going to have a special focus as a church, um, joining with other Baptist churches around Victoria in, uh, in, in praying for, increasing our awareness of and advocating for uh, for, for the people of Myanmar and, and some of the horrendous situations that continue to be the case there. And uh, there will be a special practical uh, offering opportunity and there will also be an opportunity to really stand in solidarity, not, not just generally with the people of Myanmar and the Christians of Myanmar, but with, with, with those that we uh, have a relationship and partner with, uh, the, the Noble Park Karen uh, people who meet at our Morty Alex site. And on that day, uh, we, we'd love to invite, we, we invite anyone to, to actually uh, go and, and, and join them at their service at noon at the Morty Alec uh, site that day. So more on that um, over, the, um, over the weeks ahead, particularly on, on that Sunday, but just an advance notice for you. Let's uh, pray as we think about our gifts and offerings. God has been good to us and uh, we we give back to him out of acknowledgement of that. We encourage you to, as a, as a part of your worship, to give online, or if you feel more comfortable, there's a box in the foyer if you're on site. But let's pause and pray. Lord God, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that uh, over this uh, Easter season that we've uh, just passed through, we, we have reflected on the, the wonder of your love, the wonder of, of uh, the, the sacrifice Jesus made and, and the wonder of the, the resurrected Jesus. And, uh, but in the midst of everyday life, there is so much to thank you for, many ways that you bless us and provide for us. So we acknowledge that and give back to you as an act of worship, as an act of gratitude, and uh, as, as we say thanks, not only giving financially, but giving of our time, giving of our skills and talents in service for you. And we uh, ask that um, you would take these things and use them uh, to honour and glorify your name, we pray. 
Amen. This morning's Bible reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. On the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, asked Jesus, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. As we go into our time of prayer, we're going to begin with a prayer by John Wesley. John and his brother Charles led the Christian revival in England in the 1700s. And this prayer that he wrote is, is challenging. Um, so let's look where it's hard to commit to ourselves. Let's see this as a challenge we need to rise to. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thy wilt. Rank me with whom thy wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine. And the covenant which I have made on earth be ratified in heaven. Heavenly Father, forgive us where we sometimes consider coming to church a chore, forgetting that others risk persecution to do so. Forgive us where we are critical of others. May we become aware of the beam in our own eye and have greater patience and insight into their situation. Forgive us for excessive consumption and the damage it does to your world. For family relationships that have become critical, help us to see ourselves through the eyes of others. 
Forgive us for mean for meanness, be it financial, our possessions, or our time. Help us to remember constantly that all things come from you. We thank you for sending Jesus to show us how we should live, for his sacrificial death on the cross and his resurrection. We are grateful that we can meet today to sing, to hear your word read and preached. Thank you for those who've studied the, script, the scriptures so that we might be well taught. We thank you too for peace within Australia, for gun control, and we pray for the US as the government attempts to gain some control in this area. Thank you for education and the opportunities available to us. In our time of intercession, we bring before you the family of Myrtle Black, who has recently passed away. We thank you for her life and contribution to the Mordialic Church and the church here. We especially pray for an end to the ongoing drought and the war in Somalia. Thank you for aid organizations, and we ask that they be able to safely get supplies to those who need them. We pray for the people of Myanmar, who have lived under dictatorships for more than 60 years. We pray for good government and for protection of your church. We pray for victims of slave trade, the slave trade, and ask that governments will take this seriously. We bring before you Danny and Beth in Central Australia, who are now returning to Melbourne. We pray for the communities and particularly the leaders and churches dealing with fighting in the communities. May your peace and love replace the anger and impatience. We remember the Andersons and all the northern communities still dealing with the effects of flooding. We pray too for the work of the Baptist Mission Australia Outback team and their leader Scott serving at this difficult time as they face many challenging situations. So we bring all of these things before you, our Creator and Saviour. Amen. Thanks, Judy. Well, Easter has come and Easter has gone. Still a few Easter eggs in, uh, in my vicinity that I'm continuing to, uh, to polish off bit by bit. Uh, I think the hot cross buns are all uh, polished off. Uh, I don't know about your, your home and your, your um, kind of a situation in those spaces, but uh, Easter is such a focal point in the Christian calendar. It's such a significant focus. It, it's, there's a real high around the Easter season and, and the lead up to Easter, of course, the, the season of, um, of, of, prepare, of sometimes often known as Lent, preparing for Easter. Uh, and this is, this is rightfully so, because the Easter time is central to the good news of Jesus and Christianity. But what lies beyond Easter, though? After the hot cross buns, after the Easter eggs, but more significantly, after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Such an extraordinary event that shapes our lives and shaped the course of history. What lies beyond Easter. God, God at work in the extraordinary, certainly at Easter, but God is also at work in the ordinary aspects of life, on the road of life, so to speak. And in 1 Corinthians, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 of how Jesus made many different appearances after that first Easter Sunday morning. And we focused last week on Easter Sunday morning on, uh, on, on Mary at the tomb and the significance of, uh, of Jesus' resurrection. But uh, what does it say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, Paul says, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, 
that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And, and uh, then it goes on to say, after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters, most of whom are st who are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. What, what do we know about these appearances of Jesus beyond that first Easter Sunday morning? We focus so much on, and rightly so, as I said, on, on, the, on the Easter Sunday morning. But Jesus appeared to many others beyond that, in the, in the hours and the days following that. And that's what we're going to focus on over, this week, over these uh, next few weeks beyond Easter, encountering Jesus beyond Easter. What, what, uh, in what ways can we encounter Jesus? In the in, in, uh, not just in the extraordinary, but in the ordinary. Because these encounters that the first followers of Jesus ha had with him were at a range of places. They were at the beach. They were on the road. They were in a locked room. But it's not just these physical places that Jesus meets people at, but where, what they represent. Jesus meeting people at the place of fear, meeting people at the place of doubt, meeting people at the place of failure, and today, meeting people at the place of being downcast. Two followers of Jesus, as Stephen read to us, one named, one not named, Cleopas uh, and, uh, and Mr. or Mrs. or Miss No Name, we, we don't know their, their name, uh, but they encountered Jesus as they walk along the road to Emmaus. What kind of a place? were these followers of Jesus at? It's described. Luke describes it for us in verse 17, where it says, they stood, they stood still, their faces downcast. When Jesus asked them, when Jesus came alongside them and said, what are you discussing together as you walk along? It tells us they stood still, their faces downcast. Have you ever been at the place of being downcast? We probably all have at times, if we're honest. Even as followers of Jesus, we, we, can, we can be at the place of being downcast out of different aspects of life and faith in this broken world that we live in. And if you have been or if you are at the place of being downcast, it's something that followers of Jesus right through the Bible experienced. It, it's, uh, it's there in the Psalms as well as here, Psalm 42 and uh, 43, let me um, read you a few verses from there. The psalm writer says in Psalm 42, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? And then it uh, go, goes on to, uh, to say again, just to emphasize, verse 11, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? And as if uh, we don't get the point, in the very next psalm, Psalm 43, says again, verse 5, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? So right from the psalm writers and uh, right through here to disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, there's a sense of being at the place of being downcast. So let's take a closer look. How did these followers of Jesus on the road to Emmaus encounter Jesus at that place? And what does that mean for us still today? Well, the first question I want to ask is, am I recognizing the presence of Jesus, even and especially at the place of being downcast? Am I recognizing the presence of Jesus, even at the place of being downcast? I had a fascinating experience that I'd never experienced before. Last month, we visited Tasmania and um, visited our, our daughter there, and as, as part of that um, we went back to uh, the church that I pastored at uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago in Tasmania and visited there and uh, connected in with the people that we knew there, which was uh, terrific. But the next day, on the Monday, Michelle and I were uh, at a little town about uh, 20 minutes away uh, from, uh, from, from this um, church and uh, we were sitting in a cafe uh, and then just couldn't help but be aware of the people sitting on the very next table to us. And why could we not help but be aware? Because they were talking about David Sterry. <laughs> <laughs> they were discussing my visit the day before to, to this church. Now, I didn't know these people from a bar of soap. 
It was 15 to 20 years on, and I know people change, but I like to think I'm pretty good with, with, with knowing people and knowing people's names, and I'd never seen these people in my life. And they obviously didn't recognize me. I was sitting at the very next table to them, and it was a, it was a weird feeling, especially just listening to this conversation, and I was very tempted to stand up and introduce myself. <laughs> But uh, I, I, I discretion got the better of me, and I, I, we, we decided we didn't do that. But we listened in, and we heard all kinds of things. About, <laughs> heard all kinds of things about people we knew well, and uh, we heard all kinds of things about people I knew very well myself. <laughs> and I was described in various ways, and hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> Being the subject of conversation when I was just alongside them and they had no idea. What must it have been like for Jesus here as he came alongside these first followers on the road to Emmaus? They're talking about him, but they didn't have any idea that it was him right there with them. At the place of being downcast, they didn't recognize the presence of Jesus. That can happen to us too, though. We may not always recognize the presence of Jesus when we are at the place of being downcast. Our circumstances, our concerns, if we're not careful, they can easily cloud our perspective. They can cause us to, rec to not recognize that Jesus is present with us, even at those places of being downcast. As, as uh, Jesus reminds us in, in his last words on this earth, uh, before going back to heaven uh, at the ascension, uh, Matthew 28, the end of Matthew, verse 20, uh, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. And physically, uh, literally, but also symbolically, the ends of the earth is each and every place that you find yourself at. I am with you always. Even when you may not be able to see or feel Jesus is, the presence of Jesus with you. Even if you may not feel like you hear his voice, Jesus walks with us. Where do we need to go, though, when we can't recognize the presence of Jesus with us? To what God says in the Bible. That's what Jesus reminded these first followers of him of. In verse 27, as they were having conversations, they were describing all about Jesus of Nazareth, who was walking with them. And uh, he says to them in verse 25, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory and then what does it say in verse 27? Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He pointed them when they didn't recognize, he just could have said, it's me. But he pointed them to the scriptures. And he pointed them to, uh, to, to, to what it said in the, in the scriptures. That's what we need reminding of too. When we, when we don't sense God's presence, when we don't feel God's presence, when we wonder, where are you, God, and, and don't feel like we're hearing his voice, we need to come back to and hold on to what God says about his presence. He, and it's there in the, in, the, in the scriptures over and over again, even when we lose sight of that. But there's a fascinating little, um, uh, little statement here. It says that they were kept from recognizing Jesus. They were kept from recognizing Jesus in verse 16. And you might ask, why? Why? Why, why on earth? Why, why would they be kept from recognizing Jesus? Why, were they, why were, would they be kept until a later point from recognizing Jesus' presence? Now, we don't really know. But what we do know from the Bible over and over again is that the timing of God's work is often different to ours. We want things to happen here and now. We want things to happen sooner rather than later. But God's work in our lives and the process and, and uh, spiritual growth is a process. It's not just one-off points. It's not just now, instant. No, it's, it's a process shaped through every part of our lives. The parts we understand and the parts we don't understand. The good parts and the not so good parts. And even when we can't recognize God, God is still at work. And God is still someone that we can have our hope in. The psalm writer, alongside being downcast in, in Psalm 42 that I read to you earlier, Psalm 42 verse 5, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? 
But the second part of, of that verse then says, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. Are you recognising the presence of God with you? And whether, and, and whether you are or you aren't, come back to what God says in, in the Bible and hold on to that. The second question today arising out of uh, the experiences of these first followers of Jesus is, are my hopes being realised? Are my hopes being realised? Verse 21, what does it say here? And, and again, it's a fascinating little statement. When they're describing to Jesus what had happened, in verse 21, they said, but we had hoped. But we had hoped what? We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. These first followers of Jesus were in a situation where their hopes and their expectations had not been realised of what they expected Jesus to be and to do. Is that because Jesus didn't deliver on something that he promised? No. It's because their hopes and their expectations reflected more of their own way of thinking than God's. But let's not be too quick to, uh, to, to point the finger at them, though, because we can easily be exactly the same. What I, wonder, what I wonder have you hoped for in life or in faith that in reality hasn't turned out as you hoped for? It could be hopes for your life. It could be hopes for your family life or the lives of your children. It could be hopes for your health, hopes for your work or retirement or, or, or something else. Life and its brokenness means that all too often our hopes and expectations aren't realised as we would hope for. Sometimes that's because of the nature of living life in this broken world, but sometimes, our ex sometimes it's because our expectations around what we expect God to be and to do aren't realised because they aren't the right ones in the first place. That was the case with these first followers of Jesus. When they said, this is what they said about Jesus. They said, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to, to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Now, what did they mean by that? Their idea of what Jesus the Redeemer would be and do was quite different to who Jesus really was and what he would do as the Redeemer. A true hope in Jesus will never let us down. But a misplaced hope, like expecting Jesus to fulfill our every want, or expecting Jesus to make all our problems go away, or expecting Jesus to protect us from suffering in this life, is a misplaced hope. It is, simply, it is not biblical hope at all, but it comes out of our own agendas rather than what the Bible teaches. Jesus is indeed the Redeemer. But he's the redeemer in God's way and in God's time, not our way and our time. One third and final question today. Are you ready and willing to invite Jesus to stay with you? The disciples, these first followers, they still hadn't recognised that it was Jesus, but in verse 28 to 29, there's this uh, fascinating uh, little extra development in, in their conversation and their walk. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. They hadn't yet realised that this was Jesus, but they were inviting him to stay with them. And when you stay with someone, what happens? Well, in my experience at least, when you stay with someone, you get to know them in a greater way. You get to, uh, you, you, you get to spend more time with them. You get to understand uh, more about them. And um, that's the nature of staying with someone. It was only as these disciples on the road to Emmaus invited Jesus to stay with them that the penny really dropped as to who Jesus was. And when they had their aha moment, when, when they uh, shared a meal with Jesus, it describes that they broke bread together, and aha, it's Jesus. And they got to know him like never before. But we need to understand that Jesus didn't press himself on them. Jesus could have said, I, I want to stay with you. But uh, uh, he, he waited for them to invite him, it seems. He, to, he, he waits for an invitation. And Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, says, the, uh, uh, says that very same thing, where Jesus says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, 
I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. I stand at the door and knock. To invite Jesus to stay with us is to invite him to be a part of our lives, is to invite him to, uh, to, to reveal more of himself to us, to invite him to be a part of every part of our life, not just on a Sunday, but on a Monday, on a Saturday, and every day in between, to be a part of our, uh, our, our, our work life, to be a part of our home life, to be a part of our recreational life, to be a part of uh, every aspect of our lives. To learn from and listen to Jesus when it comes to each area of life and to truly allow Jesus to be Lord of our life, not just our Saviour. That's what it means to truly invite Jesus to stay with us. Jesus meets you and I, even today, right where we're at, on the road of life and faith beyond Easter. He meets us even in the place of being downcast. He creates opportunities for us to grow in understanding more of who he is and what he calls us to. Creates opportunities for us to become more aware of who he really is and what he's like and his purposes for our lives. He's still doing that, just like he did with these first followers of Jesus. And he invites us, he invites us to allow him to be an, a part of our lives, not just in, in the parts that, uh, that we choose, but in every aspect of them. So let's pray together as uh, we just uh, uh, draw uh, this uh, reflection to a, to a close. Lord God, we thank you so much that you meet us where we're at, even when we don't recognize your presence. Thank you, that you, thank you for your presence. Thank you for the presence, your presence that is there with us because of what you say in your word, whether we whether we recognize you in, the, in that space or those situations or not. When our hopes and expectations may not be turning out as we'd hoped or when we may be downcast. Thank you that we can trust you. Thank you that we can trust your bigger picture, that we can trust your plans and purposes and that we can invite you to stay with us, so to speak, or to be a part of our everyday lives to allow you and your timing and your way to be our way, to find and follow Jesus. So Jesus, afresh today, even this week beyond Easter, thank you that we can encounter you and continue to know you at work in the midst of our everyday ordinary lives. Thank you for the extraordinary nature of Easter and all that that, that means. But thank you that that flows through into everyday ordinary life and all that that means too. And for that, we are ever thankful. In your name we pray. Amen. Bye.
thank you to our singers. Wasn't that a lovely song? And thank you, David, for the message. Uh, a reminder to everyone who's here today, or for those watching online, if you're in need of comfort, spiritual guidance, or would like to talk something over with someone, for those who are present here today, there will always be one or two at the front. Come and have that chat. It often does resolve issues. And there is a way to make contact online as well. So let us close with a benediction. As you go into this day, remember that the light of God surrounds you. The love of God enfolds you. The power of God protects you. Wherever you are, God is behind you, before you within you, above you, around you, and ahead of you. You are blessed and you are loved. May you truly know that, and may the joy of God's delight in you make you whole. Amen. <laughs>